Uh, Mr. Speaker, Madam Vice President, Honorable Members of the United States Congress, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I never get such nice applause from the Japanese diet. <laughs> And let me introduce my wife, Yuko, who is in the gallery. <laughs> the fact that I married Yuko should give you great confidence in all my decisions. <laughs> I'm truly honored to speak here in this citadel of democracy and before you, the representatives of the American people. Nine years ago, the late Prime Minister Abe, who was a close friend of mine, stood in this very spot and gave an address titled toward an alliance of hope. I was foreign minister in his cabinet at that time, and I was deeply struck to witness the bond between our two countries. Since childhood, I have felt a connection to the United States perhaps because I spent my first three years of elementary school at PS20 and PS13 in Queens, New York. <laughs> Even though I was the only Japanese student there, my classmates kindly accept, accepted me and helped me immerse myself in a new culture. We al arrived in a fall of 1963, and for several years, my family lived like Americans. My father uh, would take the subway to Manhattan, where he worked as a trade official. We rooted uh, for the Mets and the Yankees and <laughs> ate hot dogs at the Coney Island. <laughs> On vacation, uh, we would go Niagara Falls or here to Washington, D.C. I and I remember things that were strange and funny to a little Japanese boy like watching the Flintstones. <laughs> I still miss that show. <laughs> Although I could never translate Yabadabadoo. <laughs> After 60 years, I have a message for the good people of Queens. Thank you for making my family and me feel so welcome. I have never forgotten it. So, I speak to you today as a long and close friend of the United States. I know that the National Park Service is undertaking a rehabilitation project in the Tidal Basin. As a gesture of friendship, Japan will provide 250 cherry trees that, that will be planted there in anticipation of the 20, 50th anniversary of your independence. Yeah. 
As you might also remember, the 1964 World's Fair was held in Queens. Its symbol was a giant unisphere, and the fair's theme was peace through understanding. And yet, we also know that peace requires more than understanding. It requires resolve. The U.S. shaped the international order in the post-war world through economic, uh, diplomatic, uh, military, and technological power. It championed freedom and democracy. It engaged, encouraged the stability and prosperity of nations, including Japan. And when necessary, it made noble sacrifices to fulfill its commitment to a better world. <laughs> the United States policy was based on the premise that humanity does not uh, want to live oppressed by an authoritarian state uh, where you were tracked and surveilled and denied from expressing what is in your heart and on your mind. You believe that freedom is the oxygen of humanity. The world needs the United States to continue playing this a pivotal role in the affairs of nations. And yet, as we meet here today, I detect an undercurrent of self-doubt among some Americans about what your role in the world should be. This self-doubt is arising at the time when our world is at history's turning point. The post-Cold War era is already behind us, and we are now at inflection point that will define the next stage of human history. The international order that the U.S. worked for generations to build is facing new challenges, challenges from those with values and principles very different from ours. Freedom and democracy are currently under threat around the globe. Climate change has caused natural disasters, poverty, and displacement on the global scale. In COVID-19 pandemic, all humanity suffered. Rapid advances in AI technology have resulted in a battle, battle over the soul of AI that is raising between its promise and its perils. The balance, ba balance of economic power is shifting the global South plays a greater role in responding to challenges and opportunities and calls for a, a larger voice. Turning to Japan's own neighborhood, China's current external stance and military actions present unprecedented and the greatest strategic challenge, not only to the peace and security of Japan, but to the peace and stability of international community at large. While such a challenge from China continues, our commitment to upholding a free and open international order 
based on the rule of law, as well as peace, will continue to be defining agenda going fo forward. As a Hiroshima native, I have devoted my political career to bringing about the world without nuclear weapons. For years, I have worked to revitalize the non-proliferation treaty regime so that we can gain momentum in pursuit of the aspiration. But there exists an imminent danger of nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear weapons proliferation in East Asia. North Korea's uh, nuclear and missile program is a direct threat. The issue of abductions by North Korea remains a critical issue. North Korea's provocations have impact beyond the region. It has also exported its ballistic missiles to support Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, greatly increasing the suffering of the Ukrainian people. Russia's unprovoked, unjust, and brutal war of aggression against Ukraine has entered its third year. As I often say, Ukraine of today may be East Asia of tomorrow. <laughs> uh, furthermore, Russia continues to threaten the use of nuclear weapons, uh, which has contributed uh, to worldwide concern that yet another catastrophe by nuclear weapon use is a real possibility. In this reality, close coordination between Japan and the US is required more than ever to ensure that the deterrence our alliance provides remains credible and resilient. <laughs> New forms of oppression are being imposed on the world. Freedom is being suppressed through digital technologies. Social media is censored, monitored, and controlled. There are growing cases of economic coercion and so-called debt trap diplomacy, whereby the economic dependency of nations is exploited and weaponized. Facing such rapidly changing uh, pressures, how do we continue to safeguard our common values? I want to address uh, those Americans uh, who feel the loneliness and exhaustion of being the country that has upheld the international order almost single-handedly. I understand it is a heavy burden to carry such hopes on your shoulders. Although the world looks to you, your leadership, the U.S. should not be ex expected to do it all, unaided and on your own.
Yes, the leadership of the United States it is indispensable. Without U.S. support, how long before hopes of Ukraine would collapse under the onslaught from Moscow? Without the presence Without the presence of the United States, how long before the Indo-Pacific would face even harsher realities? Ladies and gentlemen, as the United States' closest friend, Tomodachi, the people of Japan are with you side by side to assure the survival of liberty. not just for our people, but for all people. I'm not saying this out of my strong attachment to America. I'm an uh, idealist, but a real realist too. The defense of freedom, democracy, and the rule of law is the national interest of Japan. The Japanese people are fully committed to these barriers. I do not want to leave our children in a society where human rights were suppressed, where political self-determination is denied, where our lives are monitored by digital technology. I know you don't either. <laughs> Upholding uh, these values is both a cause and a benefit for our two countries, as well as for the generations to come across the world. Uh, right now, Japanese and US service members are working side by side to deter aggression and ensure peace. I admire them, I thank them, and I know I speak for all of us when I say they have the gratitude of both our nations. On the space, spaceship called Freedom and Democracy, Japan is proud to be your shipmate. We are on deck, we are on task, and we are ready to what, uh, do what is necessary. The democratic nations uh, of the world must have old hands on deck. I'm here to say that Japan is already standing shoulder to shoulder with the United States. You are not alone. We are with you. Japan has changed over the years. Uh, we have transformed our, ourselves from a reticent ally, recovering from the devastation of World War II, 
to a strong, committed ally looking uh, outward to the world. Japan has transformed its national security strategy. Uncertainty about the future stability of the Indo-Pacific region caused us to change our policies and our very mindset. I myself have stood at the forefront in making our bilateral alliance even stronger. In 2022, uh, we an announced that we would secure substantial in increase of our uh, defense budget by fiscal year 2027 to 2% of GDP. <laughs> Possess counter-strike capability and improve cybersecurity. Today, deterrence that our alliance provides is stronger than ever, bolstered by U.S. extended det deterrence for Japan. Japan has taken strong sanctions against Russia in the wake of its aggression against Ukraine. We have announced over $12 billion in aid to Ukraine, including anti-drone detection systems. This is a part of NATO's aid package. And yes, we are even working with NATO on the other side of the world from us. I might add that in February, I helped a devastated Ukraine, Ukraine get through these agonizing times. I hosted the Conference for Ukraine's Economic Growth and Reconstruction. Japan will continue to stand with Ukraine. As the geopolitical landscape changed and as Japan grew in confidence, we expanded our outlook beyond that of being America's closest ally. We first became a regional partner of the United States, and now we have become your global partner. Never has our relationship been so close, our vision and approach so united. Today, our partnership goes beyond the bilateral. Examples include trilateral and uh, quadrilateral cooperation among the U.S., Japan, the Republic of Korea, Australia, India, and the Philippines, as well as cooperation through the G7 uh, and with ASEAN. Three le leaders of the U.S., the Republic of Korea, and Japan convened at Camp Davis last summer to inaugurate uh, a new era of our partnership.
And from these various endeavors emerges a multi-layered re regional framework uh, where our alliance serve, uh, serves as a force uh, multiplier. And together with these like-minded countries, we are working to realize a free and open Indo-Pacific. Here in this chamber, we should have strong bipartisan support for these efforts. Japan, Japan believes in U.S. leadership, and we also believe in the U.S. economy. Japan is the num number one foreign direct investor in the United States. Japanese companies have invested around $800 billion, creating almost one million American jobs. These are good jobs uh, with half a million jobs in manufa manufacturing sector alone. At home, I'm embarking on a set of initiatives called a new form of capitalism to drive the Japanese economy. The public and private sectors are joining hands to transform the social challenges we face into engines of growth. Wage increases, capital investment, stock prices, all have attained levels not seen for 30 years. Japan, J the Japanese economy is now making strides by capitalizing on these unprecedented and major changes. A growth-oriented Japanese economy should also spur even greater investment in the United States. And we can then help boost the global economy to steer it toward a strong growth uh, trajectory in the, in the years to come. Just yesterday, President Biden and I demonstrated our commitment to leading the world on the development of the next generation of emerging technologies such as AI, quantum, semiconductors, biotechnology, and clean energy. And the scope of our bilateral cooperation expands to space as well, illuminating our path toward a brighter and more hope, uh, hopeful tomorrow. The TV broadcast of Apollo 11's uh, lunar landing of 1969 is still shared into my memory. Japan's uh, lunar lander mission in January uh, achieved the first pinpoint landing in history. <laughs> Yesterday, uh, President Biden and I announced that the Japanese national will be the first non-American astronaut to land on the moon on the future Artemis mission.
And we have two astronauts with us today. Would Mr. Hoshide and Mr. Tani please stand? And Mr. Akihiko Hoshide uh, has flown to space three times and served as commander of the International Space Station for five months in 2021. <laughs> and next to, next to him is Mr. Daniel Tani. He is a retired Japanese-American astronaut who has conducted six spacewalks and in his two missions logged over 50 million miles. which is a lot of frequent fire points. <laughs> and Mr. Hoshide and Mr. Tani, uh, living symbols of our collaboration in space. And we will have many more such collaborations in the future. Thank you, gentlemen. Let me close with this final thought. I want you to know how seriously Japan takes its role as the United States' closest ally. Together, we carry a large responsibility. I believe that we are essential to peace, vital to freedom, and fundamental to prosperity. Bonded by our belief, I pledge to you Japan's firm alliance and enduring friendship. A global partners for the future. We are your global partner today, and we will be your global partner in the years ahead. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for your hospitality. And thank you for the role you play in the world. That is all. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.